This week, the second week of May, has been designated as National Stuttering Awareness Week. Now, that's ironic because I spent the last 69 years trying to keep people from being aware that I'm a person with a stuttering problem. So, so when I was born, I think I, 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 I know that I lost the linguistic lottery and I joined the 1% of the human population that focuses stress or anxiety or, or tension on the muscles of the larynx, which causes a stammer or a stutter. I didn't know that then. All I, know, all I knew when I was a little kid was my words didn't come out right. And it was embarrassing, and it was anxiety-ridden, and I didn't want to do it. So I became what I call a closet stutterer. A closet stutterer. By the time I got to school, I remember we were sitting around the table waiting for, for our turn to read out loud to the teacher from the reading book. And just before it got to be my turn, I, I had to go to the bathroom, of course. So I went in there and I sometimes actually went to the bathroom, but usually I just washed my hands and washed my hands and washed my hands until the recess, recess bell rang, and then I was free. By the time I got to junior high school, it's not called, it wasn't called middle school then, it's called junior high school. That's where the serious professional bullies were. I got real quiet. Now, my teachers probably thought I was very shy or introspective. Truth be told, I was neither shy nor introspective. I just didn't want to give the bullies anything to work with. By the time I got to high school, rather, by the time I graduated from high school, there was a war on, the Vietnam War. And my fear of failure of fluency was up here, and my fear of getting drafted and dying in, in, in the rice paddies of Southeast Asia was way up here. So I weighed my three logical choices, get drafted, go to war, go to Canada, I didn't know anybody there, and, <laughs> or go to college, because in college, that's where the draft the draft student deferments were. And as long as you succeeded in school, you didn't have to go to war. So I, I got on an airplane and I enrolled in a university 1,700 miles away from my home in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Great place, wonderful people. Why did I go out there? Because I wouldn't be recognized as the kid that couldn't talk or wouldn't talk. So everything was going along great in college. Yeah, yeah, after all, it was the 60s. And uh, just before my senior year in school, I remember there was a class, a, a, there was a required class for graduation that I hadn't taken yet. And some of you probably can anticipate what it was. You got it, Public Speaking 101. The dreaded Public Speaking 101. So, you know, they didn't have uh, Google back then, but if you Google top 10 human fears today, right up there with fear of falling and fear of dying, right up there in the very top is fear of public speaking. And that's just in the general population. That doesn't speak to the 1% the like me. So, I was back into a corner. I had to take public speaking 101 if I wanted to graduate and stay away from the war. So, interestingly, halfway through the semester, something unusual happened. I discovered that if I put my, my sorry about that, if I put my speeches in the form of a story, then it came out better. You know, people don't. People who stutter don't stutter when they're singing in the shower. They don't stutter when they're talking to their their dog or t to small children or whatever. And, and I discovered I did not stutter when I put my speeches in the form of a story. And that's the first time that I counted the gift of story. By the way, I did graduate, and, uh, and I got a, a job, 
and a teaching deferment. And I was hired as an itinerant elementary physical education teacher where the kids looked up to me figuratively and literally. And the very youngest ones were pretty sure that my first name was Jim. I worked in that field for 36 years, and every time I got a chance, I told the kids a story. Four years ago, I attended a a regional storytelling festival in Lydis, Pennsylvania, not too far away from my home. And during the day, during the middle of the day, I, I told a story at the open mic session of the festival. And one I've told to children for many years, but to grown-ups for the very first time. And then a month later, I got an email from the organizers of the, the festival offering to pay me money to come back and share my story on the main stage. And when I arrived, I discovered that I was strategically placed in the, in the program for the evening between two iconic legends of the storytelling world. Some of you may even know these names. Bill Harley, who has won several Emmy Awards for for his recordings of stories, and the Dean of Festival Storytelling, um, Donald Davis. And I, I was sitting there in the front row, just like you all right there, And I was sitting there trying to figure out whether I just died and went to storytelling heaven or if I was in way over my head. And then Bill Harley started his story. And it was so engaging. It was so, I I was so into it, so much so that I forgot to be nervous about my own. And that's the second time I I encountered this, the, um, And that's the second time that I encountered the magic of storytelling. So, 1% of the human population is affected by by the uh, tightness of the larynx, which causes a stutter. 1% of the American population would be 3.3 million people. Maybe somebody in your life, or, or, or your circle of friends, or your coworkers, or your family. And if that's the case, next time you see them, when, when, when you're given a chance, sit them down and ask them to tell you a story. And maybe you will give them, at least you will give them the gift of your time and your patience. And then maybe they can, at some point, stand on a stage such as this. And they can, with total verbal fluency, can say six, the six magical words of storytelling which are, let me tell you a story. Thank you very much.